My name is George Orsison. I'm a physical therapist, a doctor of manual therapy, uh, and a uh, scientist, co-investigator, and consultant for an in-flight definition study for NASA, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, with an official research uh, through the University of California, San Diego. So my uh, work with NASA is uh, directly involved with 12 astronauts before and after flight, after six month journeys and uh, missions in the International Space Station. So we're defining some uh, biological issues and uh, spinal issues for the astronauts. I've been uh, working with NASA officially since 2010, so about seven years already. But I volunteered my services uh, in 2000. Uh, I was able to produce through uh, the help and uh, and uh, help and the help and uh, and supervision of Dr. Alan Hargens, the principal investigator for the in-flight definition study, risk of intervertebral disc damage after prolonged space flight. Uh, the, the story behind this is because uh, in 1996, I met a famous NASA scientist through uh, the University of California, San Diego. And by the way, uh, this uh, gentleman, Dr. Alan Harkins, is very well known in NASA. And just last June 15, he was, award he was awarded uh, with um, this, uh, the Distinguished, uh, Medal, uh, Distinguished Medal Award for NASA. It's the highest award for civilians for his lifelong contribution to the space program. So he is my uh, he is my mentor. Thank you, Dr. Hargens. In 1996, I met Dr. Hargens, and he was in a lecture about exercise in space. It's because we have to mitigate some of the uh, the ill effects of space. Because space has been known as an analog to aging. It's like advanced aging in space. Uh, all the the things that can go wrong, all the degenerative or hypotrophic changes are happening without gravity. So when I listened to Dr. Hargens, he mentioned that the astronauts develop back pain in space, but NASA does not know exactly what's happening. So uh, as, a, as a Filipino, I was thinking that maybe uh, it's time for uh, some involvement in the Philippines. I approached Dr. Hargens and uh, suggested that I may know what, what the possible causes are. So Dr. Harvard told me that I need to make sure to get involved with research because in NASA, we cannot work on speculations. We have to work with hard evidence. And I had a theory then. I presented the theory with Dr. Hargens back then in uh, the, 19, the late 1990s. In the year 2000, he agreed to write the uh, article with me. It became the article, uh, so the, no, the first uh, workable theory why low back pain develops in space and why herniated discs are occurring about 4.3 times greater than the, uh, than the uh, average uh, aviation population. So the incidence is high in astronauts. So I presented the ideas behind it, possible ideas, and we created the, uh, the research. I wrote the research together with Dr. Hargens. And it took us seven years to write the research. This has never been written before. The, in, the information is so uh, different and so new. So new. In 2008, we were finally published in the Aviation Space and Environmental uh, Journal. And uh, the article became basically a hit because it was the first workable theory. So it became a crucial stepping stone for, for, for astronauts and scientists to base further research on what's going on in the spine. So every year, NASA delivers what you call a critical path uh, roadmap, and these are GAP, or they call it GAP, which is it's a call for research. GAP means there's a gap in, in the technology. What's happening with the, with, the, with the astronauts, we don't know. And why are we concerned about that? Because uh, they are investing millions of dollars for each astronaut, so we don't want injured astronauts. The astronauts are experiencing back pain. Uh, at least 68% of, um, of the shuttle flyers develop back pain in space. And when they return, there's a high uh, incidence of, of herniated discs. Even the pain is a, is a problem, because if you're in pain, 
you may lose concentration. You might you might uh, end up being incompetent in what you call egressing, egressing the spaceship, let's say landing for emergency purposes. So uh, I created this um, this theory, and the theory that I created was based on um, changes in the disk, in the intervertebral disk of the spine. Space exploration is is crucial in in, uh, in humanity. In the very beginnings of time, it is just for human to explore, to find out what's there. So before it was, uh, it was exploration of the, of the oceans to find new lands. And now that we've pretty much known what Earth is about, although there's still mysteries and still uh, technologies that await us, we need to go to the final frontier, which is space. So the idea is what's there. It's just inherent in human nature to understand uh, humanity's place in the universe. Why are we here? Did somebody create us? You know, there's also always this this uh, this argumentation of uh, is there a god or is there not a god? So those are questions that are inherent in humanity, and I believe that it propels humanity forward the more we go into exploration. This time, the final frontier. I believe uh, the Philippines is ready. Uh, readiness is pretty much any time. You know, there is no time frame when you will be ready. You have to be ready now. The greatest asset of the Philippines is uh, is our uh, uh, our human brains. Uh, the Filipinos have been known to be very creative and contributed uh, with uh, many technologies all over the world. And what we can contribute for the Philippines is probably our young, our young generation to get them involved with uh, STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics and get them involved with aerospace or technologies uh, involving, uh, involving um, elements of space exploration because that's what we can contribute as a, as a society. We don't have the, the funding you know, to build spaceships and rocket ships, but we have people who can contribute with the people who are already established in, in uh, building these technologies. So we have the manpower. In 1970, there was a rocket car that was built. It's called the Blue Flame, and it was uh, built by the rocket was built by uh, by Raymond Dossman. So it broke the, the absolute land speed record of roughly about 650 miles per hour. So the absolute land speed record is is the fastest speed that a car with the wheels touching the ground can attain. Now after 1970, the uh, United Kingdom have, have basically grabbed the, the record and I think the record is around 700, 746 miles per hour or something to that degree. Now the United States wants to bring it back, bring back the record. So uh, I am a part of that uh, team. I'm the only Filipino in that team. It's, I'm the human performance consultant. And we have a new car in the making. It's a rocket car. It's called Project Blackbird. So Project Blackbird is designed to punch through the, the punch through the air with a car, three-wheel car, touching the ground. And the very amazing dimensions of this car is that it is about 37 feet long. It is about 23 inches wide and about 35 inches high, roughly about 4 inch ground clearance, 3 wheels, and a maximum speed of Mach 1.1, which is, uh, if you're familiar with Mach, it is the, it's the measurement of the speed of sound. So we, are, we want to break the speed of sound at approximately 800 miles per hour, because on the ground, I think the speed of sound is around 4 hours, 746 miles per hour. So we want to break it using a green rocket. So people are asking, what's a green rocket? A green rocket is a rocket that is non-combustible, that will not produce uh, toxic, toxic fumes. It is powered by hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, and it is catalyzed by silver. So when it, when it fires up with a thrust of about 25,000 miles per hour, the byproduct is water, 
and oxygen. How cool is that? Now, we're breaking the record at the same time, we're adding water and oxygen to the atmosphere. So the car is basically an arrow on wheels. And the main driver uh, is Mr. Bill Marquardt of Illinois. Bill, if you're listening to this, uh, hello. Thank you for involving me with this, with um, my involvement with the uh, NASA IVD team. And we, by the way, we are called the IVD IVD team, the Intervertebral Disc uh, Team for NASA, and also with Project Michelangelo Foundation for empowerment of children and young adults worldwide. So we are we are thinking of doing this. Hopefully, the uh, the car is done by 2018, and this will be at uh, the Al Albert uh, Flats in Oregon. So we are getting ready for that. So when it's ready, it will be worldwide news. So watch out. What what people uh, do usually is science fiction. Okay. I'll tell you what inspired me. Back in uh, July uh, 1969, Apollo 11 went up and they landed on the moon. I was six years old during that time, in 1969. I watched it with my father, and while I was looking up at the night sky, I was thinking, wow, there are people, there are men on the moon. So. It starts with giving that sense of awe to children. Get your children involved with um, with these technologies. Show them the, 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 the beauty of, our, of, of reaching space. And of course, uh, science fiction. Everybody likes, uh, let's say, Star Wars, Star Trek, and, and so many things. It starts with, with exploration and, uh, and, and the need for that awe. That's why if you speak to uh, astronauts, and I've spoken to several of them, just about every one of them have started watching science fiction and being introduced by their fathers or friends or uncles in the beauty of rocketry and in, uh, in the, uh, the new technologies. So it's the children. Tomorrow's space, space explorers to Mars are children right now. Because we'll think about within the next uh, 20, uh, 2030s where we will launch as a humanity to Mars. So get your children involved, inspire them. I would like to, to just speak to children and get them involved and, uh, and show them videos and everything else. And by the way, for the Filipino people and children, uh, in 2016, May 30, 2016, uh, I personally sent through my foundation, you know, Project Michelangelo Foundation, the Philippine flag. It went to space. Uh, it's it's near space. It's uh, over 100,000 feet of, uh, of altitude through a high altitude uh, balloon launch through uh, my friend, uh, Mr. Um, Daryl Hedges. Uh, he's now in Arizona. So he owns the HAB LLC. And, uh, I thank him for uh, for helping Project Michelangelo Foundation send uh, a high altitude balloon with telemetry. So to get the children involved, we had it uh, live streaming. We had the telemetry, which was recording the height, the speed, the direction, the wind speed. So we predicted where it was going to launch, uh, launch and land. And we had a chase team. So you have you have to have that practical excitement. Get the children involved. Get even the adults, because when the adults are involved and excited, it pours into the children. So just to uh, let you know, the Philippine flag has already reached space. You can uh, you can find it on YouTube. So let's look for Project Michelangelo HAB or NASA and you will see the high altitude balloon with the Philippine flag there. What I think about the universe, I am in awe. So let's think about uh, why we need to be in awe. We know we exist. You can see, you can feel. So the, the saying is from uh, Descartes around 1644. Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. So if you think about that, we know we're alive. Each one of you listening, you know you're alive. But if you look at statistics about probability values, what is the probability 
of the universe began in what we call the Big Bang. From out of nowhere, it exploded. All the materials exploded, and it formed the planets and uh, the laws of physics and human beings as we know we are. So somebody actually uh, created an equation of all the possible variables. What is the possibility? the probability of a human being would exist from an explosion for some billions of years ago? Well, the answer is astounding. The probability is 1 times 10 to the power of 2,685,000. Now, people will, will react, what is the 10 to the power of 2,685,000? Well, the amount of atoms in a human body is roughly about 10 to the 27th. Can you imagine that? Your, your human body, the whole human body, the amount of atoms is about 1 times 10 to the 27th. So the probability value of us existing through an explosion of 1 times 10 to the power of 2,685,000 is there. It means that it was impossible. Can you imagine the probability values of us becoming human beings was impossible. But why are we here? We are here. We are possible. How can something impossible be here? So that means there's a sense of all that there must be some form of intelligence that uh, that created what we call created. Because if you don't know who, where you come from, you were created. Simple as that. So in understanding the universe, we cannot just understand it by science because science only describes what is. It cannot invent things. Uh, when we think we invent it, we just, we're just describing the processes already. So what I think about the universe, it's unfathomable. Uh, there are string theories and there are um, and the hypothetical and theoretical and subatomic theories and quantum physics theories about what the world is. We see three dimensions right now, three dimensions. Height, width, length, and the fourth dimension is supposed to be a linear time. So it keeps on going. Of course, Einstein, Einstein's uh, theories combine space and time into one fabric because you can alter the speed of time. We have not returned back yet. We don't have that technology sufficient enough to do that. But theoretically, it's possible. If we have four dimensions that we kind of know of, that we understand because of our sensibilities, we were limited understanding. In string theories, there are about 10 dimensions. 10 dimensions. In the whole of the science of uh, calculations, there's about 26 dimensions. That's mind-boggling. So in reality, what our human mind is, is so limited. It, it's limited that it cannot understand anything farther than what our capacity is. But it does not preclude that it does not exist. It exists, it's just that we cannot understand it. As much as, let's say, a cat. A cat can only understand a certain reality. They cannot understand anything beyond that. But it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It's the same. So if you compare that to the human brain, the human brain and the mind is there, but it's limited. It's finite. But the universe is infinite. So if we look at the different dimensions, there is also um, a proposition that what we have here is only a hologram. A hologram, a projection of a two-dimensional universe or a two-dimensional world of information. So it's still up for grabs, uh, how to explain it. I think we can uh, we can understand it to the best of our abilities just by human exploration. Science is one of them. Being human in a, the poetic part of being human is also inherent in it. So I think that's uh, what creates the, the fulfillment of humanity is to find out, to explore what's there, to go where no one has gone before. My message is that we're headed that way. Sooner or later, our, our, our world as we know it will be destroyed sooner or later eventually it does not have to be tomorrow well if it's going to be tomorrow it can either be two things man-made nuclear ther uh, thermonuclear war or natural an asteroid which is a high or large impactor that could destroy the whole planet so there's two possibilities 
Well, the, the third one is just the aging, because in the aging of the universe, our sun, as we know it, the nearest star, will expand in, in eons and eons. When it expands, and the, it will engulf the Earth. So life as we know it will not be here anymore. So if we would survive as a human species through that time, we probably need to move out of here. And the only way to do this is technology and space exploration to find new habitable planets, to terraform a planet. So if it's so similar enough, we can terraform it. That means if we have enough technology that we can we can create a help create atmosphere or conditions where humans can live. And of course, the human body will start adapting to the new gravitational loads as um, as it's hypo, uh, hypotro uh, hypotrophying or degenerating in hypo gravity environments. For further information, we invite you to visit philippinespace.com, pangkalawakan.com, and the openspaceschool.com. Thank you very much. Maraming salamat po. Mabuhay, Filipinas.